All right. Okay. Exam one, chapters one through three, chemistry 100, intro to chemistry. Well, let's see. Um, and I'm working from the review document that you can find in Blackboard. Okay. So if you go into the review document, you, you will see some of these repeated and already dealt with. Uh, let's try a really simple one, uh, unit conversions. Okay. Let's say you start off with 6.6 .6 kilograms, and you want to express that in terms of milligrams. Okay? There are two approaches you can use to this. Um, as a general concept, if your units of measure get smaller, the number gets bigger because they have to equal one another. So um, this unit is getting smaller by a factor of what? A million, right? Because that's a thousand times bigger than a gram, and this is a thousand times less than a gram. So the change is gonna be a million times. So we could say that's 6.6 .6 times 10 to the sixth milligrams. Or if you know how many places you have to move, you know that as this one gets smaller, that one has to get bigger. You can say this and just add a bunch of zeros so you can, so there's some place for your decimal to go. And just say uh, kilograms to grams is one, two, three. Grams to milligrams is one, two, three, there. And get rid of those. So this is, uh, Right, 6.6 .6 million, or, yeah, 6,600,000. And of course, um, you only have two significant figures here, so your answer can only have two. Right? So all of these zeros are going to be, if you write in standard notation, you leave off the decimal. Right? We did that, didn't we? one of those chapters. <laughs> right, so we leave that decimal out because these are the only two that are significant. Um, actually, that was two approaches, wasn't it? There's a third approach. And the third approach is um, dimensional analysis. You know, what factor is going to convert from one to the other? Let's do this. Yes, we're going to do a chain conversion. Okay, we know that um, we have to cancel kilograms, so this kilogram has to be in the denominator. Right? In the numerator, then, we can say we're going to convert from kilograms to grams. So one kilogram is a thousand grams. Right? So that cancels this one and leaves grams. We're not quite there yet. Okay, so we need to cancel grams and leave us with milligrams. And we know that for each gram, there are a thousand milligrams. Okay, so we cancel our grams. And now we have 10 to the third, 10 to the third, 10 to the sixth times 6.6. .6. So, the more than one way to uh, Skin a fish, I don't skin cats. Okay. Unit conversions. Let's see. How about, let's try this one. Say we start off with uh, minus 12.2 degrees centigrade, and we want to convert that to degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. So we need that formula. And the one that I remember is uh, Fahrenheit equals, excuse me, nine-fifths 
centigrade plus 32. It just sticks in my head. And of course, um, if you if you continue to go into Blackboard and look at these review documents, you'll see on the last page or pages uh, useful information. Uh, it'll get bigger as the semester progresses. I just add to it. But this will this will tell you the useful information that will appear on the exam. If it's here in the review document, it'll be on the exam. Okay. And this one does have the formula. Uh, the formula as written here is like it is in the book. We just convert that to 1.8. Okay. Either way it works. So, is it in the form that you need? Well, yeah. Because Fahrenheit is the one we're looking for. Centigrade is the one we have, so all we have to do is plug in the numbers. So we say Fahrenheit uh, equals uh, 1.8 minus 12.2 degrees centigrade plus 32. Change that sign and 1.8 times 132. And I get uh, my calculator tells me it's 10.04 degrees Fahrenheit. But of course, um, that's an exact number, that's an exact number. So we only have to satisfy three significant figures. So this would be rounded off to 10.0 degrees Fahrenheit. So we have, we have an intuition, a feel for what 10 degrees feels like. Right? That's cold. But we don't really have an intuition for centigrade because right? we were raised with Fahrenheit. But, uh, you don't need to know that to solve the problem. Okay. Let's see, I'm gonna start checking ones off the backtrack. How about um, a density problem? Density equals mass divided by volume. Okay. So in this case, we're going to use that formula, and we're going to determine which one of these three objects will float. Okay, in water, I should specify. Okay. That's a, there are lots of different liquids. You know, if we put something, put almost anything in mercury, and it'll float. The water has a density of uh, 1.0 grams per mil, roughly. Depends on the temperature, but that's that's good enough to answer our question. Okay, the first object is 50 grams and 69.4 milliliters. The second object is 60.9 grams and 54.7 millimeters. The third object is 100 grams and 40 millimeters. Okay, so um, this, this is a recurring theme for me. When you have to make comparisons and the calculation for each one of the comparisons is identical. So I, I channel Henry Ford, just do an assembly line. So we set it up so that we can do this one, and we use the same procedure to do this one, the same procedure to do that one, okay? Um, that you can go through it and you can calculate the numbers. You can calculate the density uh, and get an exact number. So we'll do that first, and then I'll, that's the long way. Then I'll show you the quick way that you can answer the question on the exam like that. So you don't have to go in and 
do all the calculations. But <clears throat> for educational purposes, uh, the density for one then would be mass divided by volume. Okay, so we got 50. So I get uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.7 to 0. Pretty significant figures. Grams per milli. And the density for the second one would be 60.9 grams divided by 54.7 milliliters. Is 1.11, and the density for the third one is 100 grams by about 40, and that should be two and a half. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we know the density of the liquid, and we know the density of the object. So physics says, you know, um, Archimedes says that only things that are less dense than the liquid they're placed in will float. Okay. So this one floats, that one sinks, and that one sinks. This one sinks faster than that one. <laughs> but that's the only one that'll float. Now that's the long way. If you press for time on an exam, then all you need to know is, is it greater than one or less than one? Right? If the density is less than one, it'll float. If it's greater than one, it won't float. So you just look at this and say, that's divided by that. The denominator is bigger than the numerator, so this one is less than one, right? The denominator is less than the numerator, that's greater than one. And also here, less than that makes this greater than one. So that's the only one that'll float, and you're done. Okay. Now if the question asks for exact calculation, right, you've got to go through it, but if it just says which one floats, there you go. You're done in 15 seconds. Uh, let's see, that one. Okay. What kind of uh, property is density? Is it a physical or a chemical property? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't describe anything that's going to change the substance. Did I talk about um, intensity versus capacity factors? I didn't do that. Okay. Um, it's an it's a useful concept. Uh, an intensity factor. versus a capacity factor. Now, most highbrow textbooks use a different word. Let's see, this is intensive, so that's pretty close. I say this one is extensive. I've heard that term before, those two terms. Yeah, and they don't mean anything to me. <laughs> These are more descriptive. Intensity, means that uh, the factor that you're investigating uh, does not change no matter where you look in the, in the substance. Okay. So density would be an, an example of that. It doesn't matter how much you have, density is still the same if you have this much or if you have that much. Okay, that's an intensity factor. Capacity factor would be like, if you're investigating uh, the density of a mass that's uh, 100 grams versus a mass that's uh, 
300 grams. That's a capacity factor. It changes with the amount that you have. The mass is a capacity factor. Density is it. Okay, so examples. Density, mass. Um, and for most intensity factors, you're talking about ratios, right? Uh, one unit of measure divided by another. And density is, is that type. But there's one type that only has a single unit of measure, and it is an intensity factor. And that's temperature. Temperature is an expression of, uh, I'll just go ahead and say, it, the average kinetic energy of the molecules within the substance. Okay, so if you've had any physics or any physical science, you know that kinetic energy uh, is refers to motion. Right? The molecules are in motion. The faster they're moving, the more kinetic energy they have, and the higher their temperature. Okay, but that's an intensity factor because no matter what size object you have. If you're saying it's, it has a temperature of, say, 20 degrees centigrade, it's 20 degrees everywhere. But like I said, most of them are ratios, and most of these are single units. Not always, but most of the time. Uh, volume would be a capacity factor. That, that factor changes with the amount of substance you have. It's useful to <clears throat> keep those factors in the back of your mind uh, when you're solving problems. You don't have to be consumed by it, but it can be useful at times. <sighs> okay. Let's see what else we can find without blowing all our valuable time chattering. Um, let's see, unit conversions. What, what do you need? If you need a conversion factor, what does the conversion factor imply? Conversion factor implies this. Something is equal to something else. That's, that's all it says. Well, that's actually, that is it. If something's equal to something else, you automatically have a conversion factor. For instance, you might say that uh, one kilogram is equal to 2.2 pounds. All you need for the conversion factor, if you have something over here that needs to be converted to something over there, and say it's in pounds, then your conversion factor is set up such that pounds is in the denominator, kilograms is in the numerator. You keep that one, cancel that one. Okay. If it's the other way around, if you have kilograms here, you just flip it. And it works because conversion factors are always fundamentally equal to one. When you multiply this times that, you're multiplying this times one because that's equal to that. Okay. And of course, you can use as many conversion factors as you need. whatever you happen to remember, or whatever you're given. It's nice if you can convert from one to the other with one factor, that's great. But if you don't know, then sometimes you have to chain them together. And it'll eventually end up where you want to be. Now, uh, let's see, it just occurred to me. Let's find one. Satisfies the problem that's in my head. Okay. Save that one. 
what I want is a conversion. Conversion where you need to convert two or more units of measure. I might have just have to make one of those. Instead of spending all the time looking for one. Okay, let's do this. Say you have um, there's your unit and it's in terms of ounces per quart. Okay, so the density of that object is so many ounces for each quart. We want to convert it to the metric system standard, like grams per milliliter. Okay. So when you have, um, when you want to convert two units in your uh, starting point to an end point with two different units, you do them one at a time. Right? So we want to end up over here with uh, grams per milliliter. So we need a relationship that will convert ounces to metric. Well, I don't know what it is, right? But I do know how to connect, convert ounces to pounds, right? 16 ounces is one pound, okay? Now I know the relationship of pounds to kilograms. Actually, I know the relationship of pounds to grams. I could use uh, one pound is 2.2 kilograms, or I know that one pound equals 454 grams. Oops, grams. That's a mess. I'll fix it. Okay. Now we've got grams. That was done. Now we can work on quarts. Okay. So, what do I know about quarts? Well, quarts is on the bottom there. So, if we want to cancel it, I learn how to write. Quarts is on the top. What do I know about quarts? Well, let's see. One quart is uh, four quarts is a gallon. Okay, so four quarts is one gallon. Okay, we're still in the English system. All right. Well, I got to get it to a point where I know a conversion factor that will convert to metric. I know what, what metric is for a gallon. One gallon, right, so I can cancel, is uh, 3.8 liters. How do I know that? because I read labels. <laughs> Pick up a gallon of milk, one gallon, it says in parentheses, 3.8 liters. And then, now that I'm, I'm in the metric system, I gotta convert liters to milliliters, right? So I gotta get rid of liters on top, milliliters on the bottom, and we know what that one is. Now we want. Okay, there you go. So we have grams, or a millimeter. Now, once you've got the problem set up like that, the rest is just crunching numbers. Because you've done your dimensional analysis, you know that the dimensions are taken care of. Now all you have to do is deal with the numbers. So I just take the numerators across and divide by the denominators. Or, if it works better for your mind, just multiply all the numerators together and put them down. And then multiply all the denominators together and put them in the denominator and then divide them, if that works better. But the way my calculator is set up, um, all I have to do is put in 32.7 uh, times 454, right, because one times that is it's nothing. And then times four, and then that's it. And then I'm going to divide by the rest of it. 
So 16 divide uh, 3.8 divide 1,000. So I end up with 0 0.9766697. So I need to say, all right, conversion factors, remember they're exact numbers, so they don't count. So I just look at this one, three significant figures, round this off to three. So we're gonna round it off to there. Six is greater than five, so I got 0 0.977 grams per millimeter. And that's how you do. So what did you do? You Divided over? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just said that one times that one times that one divided by that one divided by that one divided by that one. Okay, so you multiply the top and you divide by that one. Uh -huh. um, it, it's kind of a mess there, but if you do this, right, uh, times one, we can leave that one out, 454 and, and four. Okay, there you go. And then on the bottom, we got uh, 16. And then we got one and one and 3.8. And then 1,000. There we go. So that's the actual calculation. You know, it might be hard to see with all these uh, units in there. But if you just pull the numbers out, that's what you're looking at. So that's why I said multiply that one, put that answer over here. Multiply this one, put that answer over here, then divide. But the rules of math says I can say that times that times that divided by that divided by that divided by that. Okay. Check me, be sure I'm I'm not uh, funny. Okay. So if you have a if you have a value with units of measure that you need to convert to something else, that's just an example of two units of measure that we're converting. It doesn't matter, the sky's the limit. If you've got a, a number up there with, with five units of measures in, you can convert it to whatever you want. You just do one at a time, conversion. And just, just chain it all the way. Go all the way down the end of the board, you have to double back, go down again, go down again, whatever it takes. You just keep chaining until you get where you want to be. <clears throat> okay, let me go back to this thing and see if, see if there's anything here that's uh, useful. All right. Um, I didn't expand on the density discussion. We we're just calculating density. But you know, of course, with any formula like that, you got these variables, three variables in that formula. If you know the value of any two of them, you can find the third. Right? That's true of any mathematical formula. If you know, if you have values for all of the uh, Variables except one, you can solve it. To get into trouble, of course, if you've only, in this case, if you've only got one value and you've got two unknowns, you can't solve that one. <clears throat> so we could rearrange this, just put the V over here and the D over there. I solve for volume. Or you could solve for mass. Like mass equals D times V. Any one of those is valid. It just depends on what answer you want. If that's your unknown, and you plug these in, if that's your unknown, plug those in. Or, if you prefer, just remember that one, plug in the ones you know and solve for the unknown. That still works just fine. Uh, okay. Did I hand out periodic table unit? Okay. So you have a general idea of what's an element. Are you periodic? Oh, um, since there's no periodic table here in this one, 
you can bring that periodic table with you and, and use it if you need it. Because right? there's one question here, here and I noticed, which of these is an element? So let's just do that. We have these to select from okay. iron ore, brass, silver, uh, wood, and water. Okay, which one's an element? Silver. Mm -hmm. So this is an element. That answers the question here, but let's go into it a little deeper. Okay. Do we have any pure substances there? Iron, I think, is iron ore. Iron ore? Uh, I know brass, eh? No, bra brass, brass is wood. Water. Yeah, water is a pure substance. Silver is a pure substance too. It's an element, but it's pure. As given, we're saying that silver, nothing else, just silver. Water is a compound that is a pure substance. There's nothing else in there but water. Um, what is uh, brass? It's a mixture, right? In fact, not just a mixture, it's a homogeneous mixture of predominantly uh, copper and nickel. Now, iron ore, as it comes out of the ground, um, it's a mixture as well but it's probably heterogeneous. So it has um, mostly iron oxide, but it has other things in there that come out uh, when it's smelted, that come out as slag, you know, stuff that you don't want. Uh, silicon dioxide is one of them. It might have some uh, sodium in it, of uh, various compounds, other things. But it's a heterogeneous mixture, okay, because it's not uniform throughout. If you look over here, it'll have a certain percentage of iron. Over here, it has a certain percentage of iron. Over here, different, okay. So it's heterogeneous. How about wood? What's wood made of? Wouldn't it be a homogeneous section? No. Mm, no. Have you ever looked at at uh, just uh, slice through a wood? Like, do you have a fireplace at home? Mm -hmm. Okay. If you look at just pull up a a, a a piece of wood that you're gonna throw in the fire. Look at the end of it. It's not it's not uniform all over, is it? It has a pattern to it, like the rings. Those patterns are there because it's heterogeneous. It's different as you move out, right? The rings are there because um, a tree grows more in the summer. So the rings are thicker and, and more diffuse. And in the winter, it slows way down. So the rings are narrower and, and denser. Okay. So that's why um, wood from trees grown in the south, in the deep south, they grow fast. But they're not very dense. Well, pine trees in particular. But if you grow pine trees in the north, where they grow a lot slower, it takes longer to get to harvest size, but they're very dense. Uh, and then, of course, there's a difference between species. You have hardwoods and softwoods and so forth. But now, wood is a heterogeneous mixture. And besides the, the uh, engineering or the physical construct, uh, the compounds that it's made of are cellulose, primarily, and lignin. 
Those are the two main ones. They're polymers, long chains. Right? Cellulose is a long chain of glucose units. You, know, you had your blood glucose checked, same compound. It's just chained together in, in huge molecules. <clears throat> Uh, not only it's, it's chained together a certain way, right? they call it uh, beta 1 4 linkages. Right? And those linkages, our digestive system can't break them apart. Right? But uh, in some animals, there are symbiotic organisms in their guts, like termites, that have the enzyme system that can break that linkage. Um, if you take that linkage and turn it into an alpha 1,4, you don't even know what that means. It's just different. Then our system can break that linkage, but it's not cellulose anymore. Then it's starch. Starch and cellulose are made from the same subunits, glucose, just big long chains. Um, but we can break starch, we can't break cellulose. Uh, Lignin is a little more complicated, so I'm going to go into that one. Okay, so let's say we've identified all of them. So we've got pure substances, we've got one element, we've got homogeneous mixture, and we have heterogeneous mixtures. Uh, by the way, what's another name for a homogeneous mixture? Called a solution. Okay. Solutions can be mixtures of almost any physical uh, state. Yeah. We normally think of solid dissolved in liquid, you know, like sugar water or salt water. That's a solution. But the air we breathe is a solution. There's two or more gases. Okay. In fact, when you put two or more gases together, they always form a solution every time. The reason, primary reason being that there's lots of distance between the molecules, so there's room for everybody. You know, just put them together, they mix, that's it. Got a homogeneous mixture, solution. Brass is a solution of two solids. You can't just put the two solids together, right? You gotta melt them, mix them together, and then when they solidify, you got your solution. Uh, pop is a solution of a gas and a liquid. Uh, let's see, what else? Let's see what we've done. Oh, liquid, liquid, and do that one. Uh, booze. That's uh, ethanol and water. Uh, or uh, the gas in your tank. It's primarily octane, which is a hydrocarbon. But there are certain amounts of uh, cyclohexane uh, even little bits of benzene, uh, and then other additives that the companies put in there to convince you that their gas is better than their neighbors. <laughs> Keep your engine clean. I don't think they're clean engines. So engines are by definition dirty. <laughs> Let's see. We did liquid, liquid, solid, 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 liquid, gas, gas. Gas, liquid, gas, solid. You can, um, in your catalytic converter in your car, there are little uh, round beads in there. And the, bead, the beads themselves are mostly ceramic, you know, cheap stuff. Like you would get from uh, uh, firing a, a, a clay coffee cup. That's a ceramic. Well, they make, they make those, and since uh, they only need a thin surface of the active metal, then they just coat those beads with platinum and palladium. So as the gases, the uh, breakdown products from your hydrocarbon and the nitrous oxides, nitrogen oxides that form in the heat of your engine, you want to break those down into something that's less noxious. So they pass them over these beads that are covered with these metals, and those gases dissolve into the metal and then react. 
and then the reactants are released. So most of it is on the surface, but some of it dissolves in the metal. So that's a solution as well. Let's see, did I miss any? That's the left. Okay, let's see what else I've missed. Because we want to cover all our bases here. Identify a chemical change. Does everybody understand the difference between a property and a change? Physical property, chemical property, physical change, chemical change. I think of properties as potential. What is the substance capable of? Or uh, what is it right now? at this very instant. So if you measure uh, temperature, that's a physical property. You could do, you could be quantitative with a number, or you could be qualitative. Okay, so the temperature of that thing is hot. Yeah. The eye on your stove, you just got through using it, and now of course they have those little red lights back there to tell you it's still hot. That's good. Um, but uh, a, a physical change relative to temperature would be as the temperature changes, your phase changes. So you, you go from um, uh, a hot solid to a hot liquid as it melts. So the melting is a physical change, whereas uh, the state is a solid or the temperature at that point is a physical property. Uh, let's see if we can, now let's look at chemical changes. Let's say, um, dry ice, everybody know what dry ice is? Some lines. Dry ice is carbon dioxide in the solid form. And so those little pieces of little dry ice, if you've ever seen them in a uh, shipping container, sometimes they ship with dry ice. Because it's cold, but it doesn't turn into a liquid. It just goes straight to a gas. So when it sublimes, it goes to a gas. And that would make, you don't, you don't leave a puddle of liquid in your shipping container, which you would have if you sent it with ice. Now, of course, they use um, those frozen bags. They're filled with a fiber or a gel or something, but primarily water that they freeze and then they put those in there. And the problem with those is if, if you go long enough, then they sweat and your shipping material gets wet. But if it's a short delivery overnight, then you're in good shape. And they're probably cheaper than dry ice, too. We used to make dry ice in the laboratory. Now, you can get dry ice uh, from a supplier, and it's made a certain way, so it's very dense. It doesn't have any gas pockets in it. So those are good if you want to drop them in water, and you put a universal indicator in there for pH, that is, color change for acidity. And it'll start off at a certain color, and as the CO2 sublimes, it reacts with the water and makes acid. So as the acidity gradually increases, you'll see the, temp the color change with that indicator. Now, the factory produced dry ice is good for that, but the way we produced it, we take a, a liquid, a cylinder of liquid CO2, and we shoot it through a device that has a screen in it. Screen, lots of little bitty holes, very, very tiny holes. And as it blows in through those holes, it, it sublimes, uh, I mean, it evaporates because it's a liquid. It evaporates very quickly. And as it evaporates, some of the, uh, uh, that heat goes into the gas, right? So you get gas, but some of it uh, extracts heat from the liquid and makes a solid. And that's your dry ice. So 
if you've got a, a liquid tank, um, let's say, let's see, what, what does the contents weigh in one of those things? I don't know, maybe 80 pounds of liquid CO2. You'll maybe get 40 pounds of dry ice out of it. So you sacrifice 40 pounds to make the gas to leave you with 40 pounds of dry ice. Problem is, this process leaves lots of gas pockets in your dry ice. So if you try to do that experiment with the universal indicator in water, drop it in there and just sits on the turf surface. <laughs> that doesn't help any. So if you want to use that kind, you've got to weight it down with something. Okay, I digress. Let's see, how are we doing on time? Uh, it's not like an hour. Oh, good. Good. Okay, so what kind of process is this? Is this a chemical change? Physical. No, it's physical, right? And one of the ways to tell is, besides the fact that you did see a change, you saw a phase change. But with the phase change, you saw no change in the substance itself. You've still got CO2 after as before. How about uh, uh, candle burning? See, this is physical change. How about that? Are we changing one substance to another? I think it's physical. You know you're half right. I mean, when I think of the wax, it hardens back again into the same candle. Yeah. Or, but some of it does not. I don't yeah. Okay. It's actually it's a combination, isn't it? Okay. When a candle burns, you got the solid turning into a liquid, and there's your wick. And uh, the wax is not going to flow up in that wick unless it's a liquid. And it's not going to burn until it can, is converted to a gas. So the heat from the flame evaporates the liquid. First it melts, and then it evaporates the wax into the gaseous form of the wax. Then it has a chance to mix with oxygen in the air. At that point, it combusts. So this part down here is physical change, and this part is chemical change because you're taking the wax and you're ending up with, um, if you're lucky, CO2 and water plus heat. Whereas down here, you have the wax, and wax is a, is a polymer. So yeah, it's both. Okay, how about, uh, what about, um, uh, food coloring in cookie dough. You had a few drops of food coloring in your dough and you turn up with uh, red cookies. What's what what change has taken place when you did that? Was there any do do we have a new substance? No, that's well, a physical change, right? You've just changed the color by the addition of that uh, food color. Um, this one's kind of like that one. Uh, liquid nitrogen, you dump it on the floor and it evaporates. Yeah, that's obvious. It's a physical change. You're just changing liquid nitrogen to uh, gaseous nitrogen. It's very cold, by the way. Uh, this is only uh, minus 78.5 degrees centigrade, okay. which is pretty cold. I mean, if you hold it in your hand, leave it there long enough, it'll frostbite. This is uh, minus 195 degrees centigrade. It's considerably colder. Takes less time to frostbite if you leave it in your hand. Now, if you leave it in your hand, if you roll it around in your hand, perfectly safe. Because it 
it uh, evaporates so fast, it forms, let's see, there's your puddle of nitrogen, liquid nitrogen. It forms a layer of gas right here. And it's evaporating so quickly. Right. And uh, that's an insulating layer. But if you leave it there long enough, then the, the heat transfer is significant through that gas layer and, and you will frostbite. If you move it around, it doesn't have time to, to cool a region before you move it to the next one. So whenever, I used to use liquid nitrogen. If I ever spilled any on my, on my hands, I just went like that and it was gone. Um, this has a fancy German name. It's called the Leyden Frost Effect. I don't know what German means. I just know the word. Now, if I were Melania Trump, you know, I'd know. <laughs> she's fluent in German. She's fluent in French. She's fluent in English. She's fluent in, uh, let's see, what's her native tongue? Slovenian, I think. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. And then there's another one next door. Uh, uh, what used to be Yugoslavia. Where the, they broke up into several countries. Yeah. One of those has a native tongue that she knows as well. So is that all five? It's five. But my guess is that since becoming first lady, she's learned phrases in other languages so that she can at least greet dignitaries. Yeah, especially with a lot of people overseas recently. Mm -hmm. You have to. Yeah, I mean, she could walk up to Angela Merkel and, and just chatter away. <laughs> Or uh, uh, Macron, the Prime Minister of France, just she'd be fine, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> or with their spouses because they went on one of those spouses tour things. Anyway, uh, let's see. Did I have another one? No, that was it. So we had one in there that was a chemical change, and in fact, our investigation showed that it was a combination. <laughs> Right. As described, burning candle, right? we didn't specify that it was just part of the, the wick, you know, what was happening around there. We said the burning candle, so sure, part of it is a physical change. And the candle will not burn until that wax is converted to a gas, because it has to be mixed with air before the reaction will occur, and it is sustainable. Okay, let's see. Turn it off. I want to get to something we haven't discussed yet. There are lots of unit conversions in here. Right? So if you want to be bored stiff, go in, get this review document, and just start crunching away. Uh, oh, here's a good one. Significant figure problem. Let's say we have, and the question is, how many significant figures in the answer? Right. So let's say we have, I'm just gonna use the numbers. There are units of measure for this, but significant figures, we're only concerned with the number. 0 0.4333 times 33.12 31.12 times 4.12.1. Okay, so we have uh, both operative rules here, both multiply, divide, and add, subtract. But we have parentheses, right? So if we if we invoke that, we start with parentheses. We do everything inside the parentheses first. So that one's by itself, that one's by itself. We just need to do this one. Then we can use multiply divide. And right, so we line up. Right, we line up our decimals and subtract. So this is zero, zero, two. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and we're limited, since both of them come out to the hundreds place, we can keep those last two zeros. So we have 
uh, three significant figures in that number. Now, um, to answer the question, we don't have to finish the calculation, right? Because the question is, how many significant figures in the answer? Right? So this one's three, that one's four, this one's four. Multiply the divide says three significant figures in your answer. If it asks for the value, of course, you're going to crunch the numbers. But to answer the question as given, that's it. Let me see if I can find one more. I'm looking for one that, that doesn't grace us with parentheses. So we have to figure out on our own how to do the calculation. Well, if I don't find it, you just use PEMDAS. There are no parentheses, right? You move to exponents, there are no exponents. Then you move to um, MD, multiply and divide. Right? You do all your multiplications, divisions, and then you do add subtract. And there's nothing special, special about that. I mean, not, no universal law that says you do it that way. That's just by convention. Because if you're not told how to do it, uh, you could get one answer and I could get a different one because we choose a different order of calculation. Uh, let's see. How about well first of all, let me see if I can draw this picture. Try to draw a beaker. And on the outside, we have markings that I can put them spaced evenly. So this is 10 milliliters, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 milliliters. And then we've got a liquid in it that, say, is. There. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, first things first. What value do we assign to that volume using this device? Right. Remember our numbers. We've got certain numbers, and then the last one is uncertain, and the last one is always estimated. Right. So we would estimate that position between 10 and 20. We consider a certain number would be the tens place, right? And the uncertain number would be whatever you estimate here, I'd say five, okay? So that's the, the amount of liquid in that beaker uh, based on our certain uncertain measurement. Now let's say we have a graduated cylinder. I'm not going to try to draw that. <laughs> it take too long. We have a graduated cylinder that contains 20.0 milliliters. Okay, based on the the accuracy of the cylinder, we have a position in there for tens. We have a position marked for ones, but we don't have one marked for this one because it's uncertain. So our estimate says, it looks to us like it's right on the ones mark. So we say, we estimate the next one at zero, point zero. So if we add those together, what can we say about uh, the value of the body? So we use the add subtract rule. Right? There's 15. But we're limited. 
right there. So all we can say is we have 35 milliliters. Okay, we're limited by the least accurate device. Okay, let's see what else I can get up out here. Difference between a law and a theory. Got that one. Got the, what do they call those things that plumbers use? Shark bites. When you're putting pipes together, you can connect pipes with this uh, the little device. Instead of putting a coupler and then having to solder it, now you can just put one of these, shove the pipe in there, shove this pipe in there, you got a connection. And it's watertight. They call them shark bites. Because once you get them in there, you can't get them apart. Except there's a tool you can slide in there to break them apart. But the original ones, they're, once they're together, you better be sure you want them that way because there's no way to get them apart without cut. But what I meant to say was um, you have the concept of law versus theory shark bite it into your head. Well, isn't, to my understanding, a law explains something that's happened and is continuously proved to happen that way, like uh, the theories of motion, that kind of thing. Um, but a theory is trying to build an explanation for it. Exactly. And further into it. Yeah. So, like, right. like, a law doesn't need to explain why it happened, just that it does. Right. <laughs> Yeah, um, Newton's laws. Mm -hmm. right. I call them laws because he never explained why. He just says <laughs> this is the way they work. Right? His first law of motion as uh, an object in motion tends to remain in motion unless acted upon by an external force. And conversely, an object at rest will stay at rest unless acted upon. Right? So you write that in your head. The second one, that's in, in words. That's a, a law in words. But the second one is a law in formula. He says the relationship between uh, mass and force is a constant acceleration. If you have a mass of a known size and you push on it with a uniform force, it will accelerate at that rate. And then, yes, the third, <laughs> the third is, is another uh, word law, right? Uh, it, and laws, um, under a given set of conditions, if you change one of the conditions, the result is predictable. Every time you get the same answer. Um, it's just that you don't apply. Now, Newton tried to explain some of this stuff. He says, called it action at a distance, particularly where it, with his universal law of gravitation. Right? So the force of attraction between two heavenly bodies, well, actually between two, any two bodies, is proportional to the mass of one and the mass of the second one uh, divided by the square of the distance between them. And then there was a proportionality constant they stuck in there. Right, to, to make this come out to values of force. But that one works every time. I right? didn't know why. They, he figured he was obligated since by that time he had a name. He says, I have to say something. So we call it action at a distance. But that, that didn't satisfy later generations, particularly Einstein. He says Einstein just just could not stomach uh, heavenly bodies pulling on that, on each other. He says, I mean, there's nothing connecting them, right? They can't pull. He thought of it in terms of push. The push, you know, that makes more sense. So he came up with um, curved space, right? 
if, if space were unaffected by a, a gravitational, a, a large body, then uh, space would be flat, uniform, and the object would just keep moving. But if it came into close proximity of a large mass, then the space has been curved. And the space itself would push on the object and take it in, possibly into an orbit. Okay, um, good demonstration. I don't have the device, I wish I did. But you know you can get the, the stretchy fabric like Lycra, you can get it in big sheets. And you get this huge hoop with legs on it, hold it up off the floor. And then you, you, you uh, fix that material uh, in that hoop. It's kind of like a, a needlepoint hoop. You know, it's got two things, you just lay it down and then you strap that bone on the outside, it holds it flat. So you take this uh, sphere of maybe 500 grams or kilogram, and you take it and you just roll it into that hoop. Just goes around like that, and you can see as it moves, it's a big dent. Yeah, that's to uh, represent the gravity well or the curved space as the thing moves through space. It actually, so Einstein's idea was that space was not empty. Space and time together are real physical things. Yeah. That's what you wanted, at least. <laughs> right. So we said, uh, and of course, the, his theory was eventually proven, you know, uh, uh, not just objects would curve through space, but light itself would curve through space. So the proof was, uh, during an eclipse, astronomers would take measurements, precise measurements of positions of stars that were close to the sun. You couldn't see them except during an eclipse. So they'd set up their cameras and they'd take position measurements of that star versus a star that was far away from the gravity, right? So it's, it's pretty well fixed in space. This one is the one that could move. Now, if your position says uh, it's here, but without the sun, it's actually over there. Oh. Then you're seeing it like that, and it's pointing to that place, but the, the physical position of the star is over here. And, and not only that, but Einstein mathematically predicted how much of an angle of deflection there would be. And sure enough, it took him a while to do it because there's so many factors that uh, contribute to a, a failure of uh, an eclipse expedition. Uh, weather is one. And the other is politics. Politics got involved in one of them that was supposed to happen in, I think, the Crimea back in uh, late 18, no, early 1900s. So soon after his theory came out, there was supposed to be an eclipse, and that one didn't work out too well. I think they finally did one in South America where they got good data and they proved it. Okay. So let's see what else we can come up with here, if anything. Uh, how about this one? I don't know if I can draw that. Um, looking for the question that refers to my picture here. Mm -hmm. Just a miscellaneous picture? Uh, no, it's a it's a scientific instrument. It's a burette. Have you ever oh. seen a burette before? I've seen once, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll just grab it to you. I think I found it here. Just... Okay. Uh, burettes are a special design. Graduated cylinders are designed to measure uh, what's contained in the graduated cylinder. So they're, uh, they're zeros at the bottom, and their maximum measurement's at the top, and then it's, it's subdivided up. But the burette is the other direction. Zero's at the top, and the large number is at the bottom, because burettes are designed to deliver. So if you start at zero, say you're, you're uh, a 
Pelosi, uh, OCD. And you, you have to you have to set your zero point there at zero. You don't have to, to use one, but let's say you want to. So you put your thing at zero. Then if you dispense in the process of the experiment, you dispense a certain amount, then you read the number. The number is the amount dispensed. So we've got this long tube. It should be straighter than that. And then at the bottom, you have the valve. And then you got a, a tip coming out here, with a small tip at the end. And the idea is that with this small tip, you can adjust this valve and just let a very little bit out. Very small drop if you want. And then if you want to deliver that drop into your vessel, you just take the, the vessel and just move it over and touch it. Touch the side of your vessel to that and it'll pick up that last drop. You know, it doesn't have to be a whole drop that's big enough to, to fall off. You can do a very small one. Um, but your zero point is, say, up here, and then a common uh, size burette is uh, 50 milliliters. Okay. So we've got uh, 10, 20, 30, 40. Pretty close. And then they're usually subdivided into, uh, in this case, we're only subdivided into mills. So we've got, uh, it's like, this is 40. So you have to read them in the opposite direction. But if you're going to read a volume off here, you start up here, right? And down here would be like 31, 2, 3, 4. Not the other way. If you read that way, you could, you'd go from this one, 20 something, down to 30. So this one's got, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Like that. So you've got 10 subdivisions, and each one of those is worth a mil. Uh, most of your rest, though, will read down to a tenth of a mil. But I don't have room to draw those in here. But for this one, let's say we've got, um, let's say we've got this much left. Okay. This is aqueous solution in your burette, so the meniscus is going to be uh, contained. And these things are, are calibrated for aqueous solutions. So you read the burette at the bottom of the meniscus. Okay. Now that's true for, yeah, for all laboratory glassware, uh, unless it says it's not. Okay. You just assume it's aqueous, right? Um, and one perfect example is a uh, mercury barometer. A mercury barometer is designed to be read top of the meniscus, because mercury goes the other way. It makes a convex meniscus. So we don't have a mercury barometer here. We've got one on the Greenberg campus. So if we were there, I could show you that when you read it, you read the top of the meniscus for your air pressure. But in this case, you read bottom. And in this case, what would we read here? Well, if we started at zero, and we read this one, we start at 40, 41, 42, and it looks like we're right on 42. So we've got a position for two, and we estimate the last one at zero. So if we started at zero, we delivered 42.0 milliliters. If we started anywhere else on there, you just subtract that position from this one, and that's how much you delivered. Okay, you just subtract your starting point. Because sometimes uh, my classes will do uh, use these to do titrations, which is I won't waste time uh, defining that right now. But uh, they might do a series of titrations that may only take ten mils. 
So you do one titration. And then your new starting point is where you ended here. So you deliver from there to there, and then from there to there. So you can do several out of one filling. Now let's see, what was the question? Oh, we did. How much material is left to be at if we start at zero? That's true. So we've got our certains because they're marks for them, and our last one is the uncertain. Good to go. It takes some practice learning how to use one of those and, and adjusting the burette. So it, it only drops what you want. <laughs> the most common mistake uh, new users of a burette will do is they'll, they'll open it too far and just go, you know, and you, you shoot way past your endpoint. Right? You're, you're looking for, you want to add a certain amount of that so you reach an endpoint, which usually involves a color change, like an acid based titration. So you get to a point <laughs> and you say, okay, so we're using phenol saline, so we're adding acid. Uh, no, we're adding, we're adding base. We're adding base to an acid. So we're starting off with our phenol saline in the, in the beaker and it's clear, at acid pH. So we're adding the base. So as you add the base, you see, as it hits the, the solution, it turns pink. And then as it stirs, you know, it dissipates. So you want to find the point where it turns pink, it stays pink throughout the solution. But you want to be very precise. So when you get close to, and as you get close to that endpoint, it stays pink longer. So you know you're approaching it. But <laughs> sometimes they'll be real careful, and then they just go too far and it goes <laughs> And it doesn't turn pink, it turns red. So, uh-oh, start over. But that's not lost experience because you know roughly where it's supposed to be. So when you set up your next one, as long as the conditions are similar to the first one, then you can start up here and you can go down to here. And then you slow down. And that saves you a lot of time. So you have to sit there and watch it all over again? Right. You don't have to go slow all the way down. But if you're looking for indicators like uh, how long does it stay in that color, then that can help you get there quicker. And that's when you do it manually. If you're in, a, in, in an industry where you have to do titrations, just add in for that. Um, most uh, production labs now, or testing labs in industry, have automated titrators. They will automatically add, and they'll, they'll, they'll actually have a pH meter in there if it's an acid based titration. And you set it for what pH do I want to reach my endpoint? You know where it's going to be. So you set it there, and it'll go until it reaches that. Stop. Report the volume. Go to the next one. Okay. So it has this little device on here with all your tubes in it, or your beakers, or whatever. And it'll just go choom, 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 and do one after another. And then it'll go back to the next row. Go back to the next row. Wow. But, of course, when you're in school, we can't afford that. And it's good to learn the hard way first, and then you do it the easy way. Because if there's one thing I know, is automation will not make a good chemist out of a bad chemist. It only makes a good chemist more productive. And believe me, I've seen some bad ones. Those are the ones that you want to, uh, uh, you want to be sure they have good lab assistants working for them keep them out of the lab. Let them just design the experiment and then let the competent technician do the work. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see what else we can find in here. Um, right, you've only got eight more minutes. <laughs> but as always, it'll be on video. And I haven't had any trouble converting it and uploading to YouTube now linking to whiteboard. When I first started this, I, it was a little iffy, but I got it down now. Uh, let's see. Oh, 
repetition at this point. A lot of repetition. I think we've covered most topics. Is there mostly going to be uh, a lot of thing conversions, that kind of thing? There'll be some. Um, let me see. I've already, I've already got the exam made up. Let me just take a peek. That's my, uh, the actual mathematics part is usually my biggest weakness. So I probably will want to go over more conversions on my own time. Um, we've got 59 points. And I think each one is worth a point. So like, like 59 questions. I try to put as many as I can without overloading. That is, making you have to take the test for two or three hours. And you don't want that. I just want to find out that you know the stuff. But I want to give you enough questions so if you make a, a dumb mistake on one or two of them, it won't cost you your whole grade. So initially, we just have 59 questions. Each one's worth a point. And uh, a lot of them, you can do in like five seconds. Some of them are just straight memory. Yeah, if there, if there are questions like, uh, this is physical or chemical change, yeah. unless I practice them, I feel I should be able to just read it all. Or you can out. knock those out, yeah. And then, of course, with, um, with some of these calculations, look at the question. What is the question asking for? I mean, is it asking for you to actually do the calculation or just to estimate the answer so you can answer the question? You know, like that density test, the first problem. All we have to do is estimate, is it greater than one or two? We didn't have to do the calculation. And we got the answer like that. Being able to find different ways of doing it sometimes, especially with test taking, is more efficient. Yeah. Uh, some of them involve process of elimination. You know, when the question says, um, uh, which one of these is true? Well, you look and see, all right, what are the conditions for true? Say, okay, it has to be this and this. So I say, okay, how about this one? Let's look down there. Are any of them not that? Okay, throw those out. So you've narrowed it down to maybe three. And then the second condition, you say, okay, ah, only one satisfies, we're done. Okay. Test taking techniques. <laughs> okay, uh, unless you have any questions, we're, we're done. We will. We'll have the exam. Um, you can take the whole period if you want, but I'm prepared to jump into the next chapter if we get done early. Uh, and as soon as you hand them in, I'll start grading. Oh, I like that. I like being able to quickly so we'll know what I Get them done. Down. Yeah, get it out of the way. You know where you stand. And, uh, there's no waiting around for me to, to go use the scantron. <laughs> I know some, some instructors like to use those uh, cards, mark off oh, cards, yeah, the ones. running through the scantron. I say, oh, well, that's nice. But I guess well, it doesn't change like the degree of how right or wrong you are. Sometimes I'll get the vast majority of the actual formula right, and I'll do it right, but I'll miss a decimal point or something like that. So right. Really close, right. but and I've got people, you know, actual theory behind the equations and like that. So I'll miss a decimal point, or I'll yeah. A no. negative instead of positive, and we'll be able to see that if you're not using the bubble cards. But if you're using the bubble cards, you'll just see if it's right or wrong. At this, for this test, each one is worth a point, so it's kind of hard for me to give you part of credit. Oh, sorry, yeah. But later on, we'll have multiple point problems, and then if you show me your work, then I can see well, you got this far, so that's worth so many points. Yeah. And I can give you partial credit. Just, just knowing if, uh, like, I've got a formula now is the biggest thing for me. And knowing who to use that. Formula. Oh yeah, that's yeah. another big one. Don't try to try to cram a uh, square peg in a round hole. It's easier for everyone that way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go through pretty much everything, especially for those conversions. That's okay. just going to get me to this week. Anyway, thank you. Welcome. Thank you for
Time to close it. Stop recording.